So today's theme is going to be albums that were hell to make and this has been inspired by reading this book which is a fantastic read, Trevor Horn, Adventures in Modern Recording, the autobiography of the great 80s producer, the man who invented the 1980s, great book, highly recommended. Now in the book he discusses virtually all the albums that he was associated with but the one that inspired this video there's a great chapter on the album 90125 by Yes. Now I knew that this album was hell to make, but I wasn't aware of the full gamut of horrendous stories that Trevor shares in uh, in the book. So um, that that is the album that's really inspired the video. But I'll I'll save it until a bit later because what I've tried to do with this is take a chronological approach. And I'm going to show maybe six or seven records, starting with the earliest, moving forward. And then if you can think of any others, I'd be very interested to know. There are a couple of other ones I can think of, which I'm not going to feature, but I'm sure I'm sure there are more. So the first one I thought of, and this is a bit of a cliche, I suppose, this is the White Album by the Beatles. I think ever since the release of the new version of Let It Be, we're maybe starting to question now some of the Beatles lore that we've come to know. This idea that from 68 onwards they were basically falling out with each other completely. It was always dreadful in the studio because what the Let It Be, what the Peter Jackson Let It Be film showed was that they were still having a fair bit of fun in the studio. Yes, there were some problems, but maybe it wasn't quite as dark as we've been led to believe. But the White Album certainly does have that reputation. I know uh, from reading accounts of the studio sessions that the atmosphere was pretty bad in the studio at this point. And um, some of those stories come from the engineers who worked on the records, people like Alan Parsons, people who were there and they were trying to work with the Beatles, increasingly finding them very ratty and difficult to deal with. Obviously, it was very fragmented. They were all doing their separate things, trying to get an album together out of all these scraps of songs that they'd written in um, Rishikesh in India, but largely falling into their own little working patterns. So you'd have Paul down the corridor doing one song, John in a different studio doing another. Whether the album was literally hell to make, I think the jury is out on that. I do think probably if the Beatles were to revisit that period in their memories, they would probably be thinking in terms of things being quite difficult and stressful. And certainly that's, uh, you know, those are the kind of stories that have come to be that have come to be associated with that record. So I thought I would start with the White Album because uh, I think we're on fairly solid ground with that one. But the truth may be more complicated than we uh, than we think. Okay, so moving forward quite a few years now, this is one that sprung to mind immediately when I thought of the theme. The first album by Squeeze, produced by the Velvet Underground uh, genius uh, John Cale in uh, 1978. So this was a case of wrong producer, wrong band really. Cale had come onto the punk scene in the UK as a result of his friendship with Miles Copeland, who was the guy who signed, who got squeezed the record deal with A&M. The brother of Stuart Copeland from the police, of course. They were great mates, and I think John Cale wanted to try and get an in, really, into the world of UK punk that was exploding all over London. So he did a couple of different productions for Miles Copeland. He produced a single for Sham 69, a couple of other things. But he famously produced the first album by Deptford's finest, Pop Purveyor's Squeeze, and he basically tried to turn them into a punk band. He was quite unhinged at the time, he was suffering from various addictions, alcohol and maybe other things as well. The, I mean, the band found him impossible to work with. He would arrive late at the studio, he would collapse over the mixing desk, unconscious, drunk. But he would do things like he would crack a whip in the studio, you know, quite literally he had a whip. He, there was one day when he locked them all in and said that you're not coming out until you've all learned to play Amazing Grace with the added proviso that they all had to swap instruments. But I suppose the thing that he did that was most hellish was that he made them junk all their songs, made them write new songs in the studio and there's quite a lot of stuff on this record which doesn't really sound like Squeeze. I don't think Kale was that interested in them as a group. He wanted them to do what he wanted them to do. He leaned on Chris Difford quite heavily to write these very smutty X-rated lyrics that Chris wasn't all that comfortable with and I think the band were very relieved to get shot of Kale after this record. They, There's two songs on the record that were not produced by Kale. One was Bang Bang, which was their second single, but of a flop. But of course, the big single off this record was Take Me I'm Yours, which was their first um, top 20 single. And that was recorded after Kale had um, 
had uh, finally flown the nest and disappeared so uh, I think that was a pretty hellish album for them to make but in retrospect they're not entirely down on the whole project and I think uh, Glenn Tilbrook and Chris Difford both agreed that Cale had um, got them to explore some interesting areas that they maybe wouldn't have explored before. Okay, so we're going to skip forward again now, a couple of years, and I wanted to feature Queen because Queen did tend to have trouble in the studio. They were famously pig-headed in the studio, I think. All of them were writers, all of them had very specific things which they wanted them which they wanted to achieve in their songs, and they pulled in different directions. Brian May certainly pulled in a different direction from Freddie. Brian wanted things to be heavy all the time. Freddie was more into the maybe the more theatrical kind of songs. You had Roger, who was more of a rocker on the side with Brian, but then you had John Deacon increasingly wanting to do soul-influenced stuff, and this is the album which they did in 1982, Hot Space, out in Munich, when they were really starting to come apart at the seams, really fraying around the edges. Freddie had started to um, frequent the gay club scene in Munich, and he was wanting to do stuff that was more dancey. Uh, Roger and Brian didn't like it, but they kind of went along with it. John Deacon told Brian that he didn't want him to play guitar on his songs anymore because he didn't like the way the songs sounded. And the engineer, Mac, the famous Munich engineer from uh, Musicland Studios, he said that when it came to making this album, and maybe even the one after that, uh, which is the works, essentially the group were completely fragmented, so he would just be working with each of them individually. So Brian would come in one day and work on his song, Freddie would come in on a different day and work on his song, so the group were not really seeing eye to eye at all. Now whether that makes it hell to make, I don't know, you're not necessarily talking about uh, huge arguments, because in their early career Queen had massive arguments in the studio, they would literally throw glasses and cups at each other because they were so so determined to have their own way, each of them, you know, big rows. Brian May often said that it affected his mental health. It was really difficult, like pulling teeth, making a record. But I picked this one because I think this really was the nadir, really, in terms of them reaching a point where they were nearly on the point of splitting up and calling it a day because things had become so kind of emotionally raw. So uh, I thought I'd go for Hot Space. Always a good one to talk about. And then... I think the following year from that, a band who had famously never really got along all that well, they'd, um, ever since the, the departure of Sid Barrett in 1968 and the arrival of David Gilmore, there had been this creative tussle, I think, between Roger, Roger Waters and David Gilmore. Roger had wanted to seize control of the group and really turn it into a vehicle for his own lyrical concerns. David Gilmore wasn't so bothered about that. He wanted to create very mellifluous music and have the listeners float away and in, all be very spacey and nice to listen to. They had rowed on Dark Side of the Moon, really, because they wanted the record to sound quite different. Roger wanted it all very dry. David wanted it very reverb heavy. They'd had arguments during um, Wish You Were Here when they couldn't agree on what was going to go on that album. And um, then things became more fraught on Animals, where Rick Wright really didn't feel like the material that, that they were doing was Floydy enough, really. Waters was becoming more and more strident in his lyrical concerns. Then you hit the wall, of course, which I'm not sure if it was hell to make exactly, but they certainly fell out with Rick Wright during the making of that, of that record. He, I think he decided he just mentally closed up shop. He just couldn't handle Roger anymore, and he was fired, of course, off the back of that record. So I picked the final cut because this was the one where Roger and and um, David Gilmore did completely fall out with each other. And uh, really it was over a production credit. David Gilmore, even though he didn't like the material on the record, wasn't that keen on it. He did want to be credited as co-producer. Don't think he got his own way in the end. I think it was, yeah, produced by Roger Waters, James Guthrie and Michael Kamen. So Roger ended up giving a co-production credit to these two guys who were not even in the group, you know, and Gilmore had wanted a co-production credit, but he didn't get it. This was the last record that uh, Roger played on and uh, Gilmore still to this day um, scarcely finds a good word to say about it. Although I think Roger's still quite proud of it. But certainly I think in, in Pink Floyd terms, this was the record where it all did turn into a bit of a nightmare, really. <laughs> 
Uh, my chronology might be a little bit out. Um, let's do this one next. I may have got these two the wrong way around, but we'll do XTC next. This is Skylarking by XTC, and this is a very famous example of an album which turned out great, but um, was hell to make, I think. Todd Rundgren, the American producer, was brought on board to try and give XTC a more American sound. Dave Gregory, the guitarist, was absolutely thrilled because uh, he was a big fan of Todd. But um, things did go wrong, really. What Todd did was he got Andy and Colin, Andy Partridge and Colin Moulding, to send him some demos of the songs out to America. And he sat down and basically sequenced the record. He decided, well, he threw away a load of songs first, and that really annoyed Andy Partridge, because Todd threw away quite a few Andy songs, which he really liked. But then he sequenced the record from top to bottom, came up with this loose concept about uh, a day in the life, and contacted Andy and said, right, I know what the record's going to be. I've got all the songs sorted in the order that they need to be, and we're going to record them in that order. It was really strange, and uh, it wasn't really what Andy was used to doing. And when they got out to uh, the studio in America, Todd was quite a hard taskmaster. They didn't find him very easy to work with at all. Andy later said that he was not a very giving person. He would never give compliments or praise. It was very difficult for them to know whether they were doing a good vocal take or whether things were going right. Andy accused Todd of being very sarcastic and having this very caustic biting wit which made things unpleasant in the studio there was one day when Andy threatened to walk out he said unless you start to treat me better I'm going to walk out of the sessions and then famously Andy and Colin had a huge row one day over the song Earn Enough For Us where Andy got it into his head that Colin was playing the wrong notes on the bass and Colin couldn't hear anything wrong with it the tension built up and then Colin ended up throwing his guitar to the ground his bass guitar and stormed out of the studio and um, had to be coaxed back <laughs> back to the band so um and then there was a huge load of nightmarish things afterwards with the mixing as well they went back to england and todd started to send them mixes for the album and they weren't happy with them over and over again and in the end todd just told them look you know i've had enough i've done the last mix that i'm gonna do so you're stuck with it and uh, that was the album wasn't a successful album commercially, but it's now looked back on with immense fondness, and it's certainly seen as a, an 80s classic, but um, certainly it was quite hellish to make. Now this one I don't have on vinyl to show, but uh, I'll show the CD. This is Paul McCartney in Press to Play, and this is another example really of where the band and the producer come unstuck. McCartney had um, asked Eric Stewart from 10CC to produce the record, or at least Eric Stewart thought that's what Paul had asked him to do. But then it turned out that that wasn't really the case, and that he'd really just been brought on board as a songwriting partner or a songwriting foil for Paul. And Paul had hired Hugh Padgham to produce the record. Hugh Padgham was this young hotshot producer. He, I think he'd done XTC at this point, but he certainly had a very modern take on things. He was a young guy. Eric Stewart was a bit over the hill, obviously. <laughs> and uh, it just led to a dreadful atmosphere on this record. Uh, Hugh Padgham didn't like the material when he first heard the material that he was going to be recording. He wasn't very impressed with the demo tape. He found McCartney really annoying to work with. He said that he had a habit of smoking joints and getting stoned and just taking too long to make decisions. And they famously had a, uh, had a big row one day in the studio where... Hugh Padgham tried to give some constructive criticism, I think, for Paul uh, about a particular vocal take. Paul didn't like that, took issue with it, and said to him something like, um, how many number one records have you made, Hugh? And uh, apparently Eric Stewart said he had his head in his hands after that. He just said he could cut the atmosphere with a knife. The sessions dragged on, dragged on for months and months, and of course the end result was a flop album. So uh, that is definitely a contender for a hellish album. Paul had a similar issue quite a few times in his career with Nigel Godridge who produced Chaos and the Creation in the Backyard. There were some issues there too but I think it was not not quite as bad as that so uh, yeah that was definitely the one that I was going to be talking about. Oh, so we'll finish, we'll come full circle then with, with Yes. I think I do, I think I've come out of sequence but I wanted to finish with this one because this is the one that I started with talking about um, 
the, the Trevor Horn book. Now I'm not going to delve too deeply into the history of this because I'm going to do, I'm going to hope to do a discussion video on this one and really get into the history of it. But some of the stories that go with this album are quite hair raising. The essential thing is that Yes had changed their singer a couple of years before John Anderson had been shown the door and Trevor Horn had become the singer for the drama album and tour. So when it came to reconstituting Yes with John Anderson but with Trevor Horn in the production role uh, you could really cut the atmosphere in the studio with a knife as far as John Anderson was concerned he wasn't going to cut Trevor any slack at all and he was uh, he was quite down on him made it a very difficult working relationship and the main thing was that Trevor had a vision for how he wanted the album to sound he wanted it to sound like a modern 80s rock record and the guys in Yes were not happy with that at all and there were numerous <laughs> numerous incidences in the studio of arguments and standoffs and just things going wrong at one stage Trevor was literally on his hands and knees pulling at Chris Squire's trousers and begging him to play the bass line as he wanted it played and um, a bit like the XTC one the band got the mixes and took them away and started messing around with them and Trevor in fact abandoned the project for a while he called Yes's manager and said you can stick you, know, you can stick this band up your ass and uh, they had to cajole him back to the fold to continue making the record and of course Trevor was right because commercially this album was was a big success and um, Owner of a Lonely Heart which is the song that which they'd fallen out over so badly was a number one record in the US so they did finally end up with their tail between their legs a little bit. Trevor Horn went on to such vast and huge success that uh, looking back they were probably quite foolish to have been quibbling and arguing with him but um, there were more stories with that one than I was aware of, so the Trevor Horn book is a good resource if you want to if you want to delve further into that. So that concludes my selection, and I'll be interested to know if anybody has any other suggestions. I hope you enjoyed that, and I will be back soon for another video. Take care. Bye bye.